This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The first period was reconciliation, and that was uh, Madiba's presidency. He had superhuman qualities of being able to suck it up and figure out what the best way is to, to, to do something. In the space of a very few years, changed South Africa from the most intractable political problem in the world to, for a time, the poster child of democracy. Those are some of the few things that I can take away from his life and hope that through the scholarship we can begin to become little Mandelas in our own rights. South Africa, where we've gone in search of a man who helped to shape a nation. We've journeyed to Cape Town, taken a boat to the infamous Robben Island, and visited Constitution Hill in Johannesburg. We always call him the old man, but he don't like that. He liked to be called Madiba. We've heard of a man of deep commitment, principles, and compassion. A leader prepared to weigh in and get his hands dirty. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. And if necessary. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. To die for his cause. He stood out. He was taller, better dressed, smiling. He was the personality of the leadership of the African National Congress. The man? Nelson Mandela. Mandela's release from prison on February the 11th, 1990, was celebrated by millions across the country. The atmosphere was one of jubilation. Mandela himself, with his wife Winnie at his side, appeared jubilant, upbeat, happy. There was little doubt that he and his African National Congress would win democratic elections if they were held. But that was far from assured. The South Africa that Mandela returned to was very different to what he had left when he was sent to Robben Island in 1964. The townships of the 1950s and 60s had been full of the energy and hopes of an emerging black middle class. But the repressive acts of the apartheid government during the 1970s and 80s destroyed that energy, those hopes, and any chance of the emergence of a black middle class. In 1976, the township youth rebelled against Bantu education and any form of authority. By the time Nelson Mandela was released, the townships were places of fear, of widespread violence, intimidation. An entire generation had sacrificed their education, and with it, any chance of employment. Now, Mandela was determined to build a solid future one based on guaranteed rights and freedom for all South Africans. One of the first things that he did when he was released from jail was to visit the committee of 12 of one of them. I was one of them that had been writing the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Significant is that you will see that practically... George Bezos one of the Ravonia trial defense team, has known and represented Mandela for much of his life. He said that uh, we must draw a good constitution, a constitution which would not only be good for the African National Congress, but the country as a whole. The guarantees of a solid constitution 
would help ease the fears of white South Africans, making it easier to negotiate the exit of the apartheid government. He knew that the new country could not be a success unless its government was trusted by the people, particularly those that, expi uh, uh, that had ex exercised power for 350 years and to a lesser extent the Zulus. And he tried to accommodate them. Mandela and the ANC had prepared for this moment for decades. What's so striking about it is that when he came out of jail some 27, 28 years later, he immediately started to give effect to what he had said at the time of his trial. After his release, Mandela and South Africa's black majority anticipated a democratic election. But the apartheid government's demands during negotiations meant those hopes were frustrated. Political violence threatened to once again set South Africa on a path to civil war. Only just out of prison, Nelson Mandela was needed by his nation more than ever. My message to those of you involved in this battle of brother against brother is this. Take your guns, your knife, and your pangas, and throw them into the sea. The demands meant more sacrifices. A family very much in need of a father figure would once again have to take a back seat. Uh, we also want to make another little presentation here uh, to Mrs. Mandela. Uh, these are boxing gloves that were presented by Mike Tyson. Who was Mandela's wife, Winnie, who had acted as his mouthpiece during the years in jail, had been continuously harassed and persecuted by the authorities. Their daughters, Zinzi and Zeni, had grown up watching their mother persecuted. And Winnie herself had become increasingly militant. Her husband's release from jail might have offered some respite. Mandela's children had grown up while he was in jail. Instead, another generation would lose him too. My illusions about that I was having back were shattered because before then I thought finally you must remember I grew up without a father because my father died when he was in prison and for me I had grown up with a very strong female influence and perhaps I thought to myself that it was going to be time for me to reconnect with that part of my life being the male figure and it, those illusions were shattered because I mean I thought I would finally go and have coffee with him in a coffee shop and talk about what, you know, the relationship I had with my grandmother and granddad are completely different in the sense that I could rock up to my grandmother and talk about anything under the sun. And yet with granddad, because he was, he was like, if he was an icon when he was in prison, he became more of an icon when he came out. And he was sort of unreachable because now you had to, to, to make an appointment to go and see him because he was inundated, because he had bigger issues to tackle. Beautiful one, by planet Earth, we must have this one. It's for the one I love. You know who you are, girl. Katana, Joe. On the 10th of May 1994, South Africa inaugurated its first ever black president. It 
was a day many South Africans would never forget. How are you doing? Very well yourself. I'm so happy. Dad, to see you. Hello, brother. How are you? Very well yourself. How are you? Greeted by the heads of the army, air force, and navy, as well as the former head of state F. W. De Klerk, Nelson Mandela. The former political prisoner now had the most powerful state on the continent at his disposal. And after signing his name, Mandela and his African National Congress, or ANC, now had the responsibility of running the country. Despite the many frustrations during negotiations leading to the election, Mandela remained conciliatory, even reassuring. We enter into a covenant that we shall build a society in which all South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts assured of their inalienable right to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. But rebuilding a country devastated by the ravages of apartheid would not be easy. It would require a commitment of energy, Brick by brick, we build now. And investment. And that would require confidence in a bright future for South Africa. The country and the world turned to the new president for reassurance. Mandela, a leader who inspired confidence, was able to deliver. The country was suddenly the rainbow nation, and its new flag was flown everywhere. A sense of optimism seemed to seep into every sector of South African society. Once again, the Madiba magic was at work. When, when, I was, when I produced this book, The Mandela Files, which was a huge labor of love, uh, it, it, was a, it was a fantastic feeling to, to, to f just to feel his involvement and to, f and to feel that this book was a summation of the best that I could produce of, of all of that. Someone who got to enjoy the golden period of Mandela's presidency was this man. Zapiro started cartooning as an anti-apartheid activist in the early 1980s. After winning a scholarship to America, he returned to South Africa and has since won scores of awards. He also has two honorary doctorates and is a familiar figure at events like the World Economic Forum. He first met Mandela in 1994. When I started drawing Madiba, I really battled with his face and then something happened, it clicked in, somewhere in 94 it clicked in and I got his face and, I, and, and he has started wearing the shirts and this parallel persona uh, that started appearing in the cartoons, it was particularly it, it, it based on, very much based on him, but very genial, the smile, the smile, the, the charisma, the warmth. Um, and the cheekbone structure and everything. So that, that, that started to be the focus and, and he would often appear in, in, in quite a, um, a benign sort of way in the, in the cartoons. Zapiro's use of satire to both criticize and applaud events in South Africa is unusual for a cartoonist. I thought I would celebrate all these, these things that had happened in the coming of freedom and the, the great hill that he 
the many more hills, but the first one here is, is reconstruction. Celebratory cartoons are, by their nature, more difficult to do than, uh, than, than critical cartoons. The, the cartoons, you want to see a cartoon that has, an e that has edge. But, I mean, I feel that Madiba, it was a very interesting thing. Through, through his presidency, um, I, I, was, I was sometimes able to kind of show him in different ways actually dealing with crises where he was called in because he was such a, a good conciliator and somebody who, could, who had that moral sway over, over many, many people. I think people from the white community and how they changed towards Madiba because of his reconciliatory abilities and because they saw what they'd been missing, there were many of them who rationalized and kind of conveniently wiped out the fact that they had said, hang him. There are so many people in the white community, I remember it, I remember it really well. I remember it as the 70s and the 80s, people were saying they should have hanged him. Mandela's conciliatory gestures as president may have won him the confidence of the white minority and the outside world, but they also exposed him to criticism. There are people who feel that, that Madiba was, was too easy in the, on the, 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 the regime, that he, that he was um, perhaps negotiating where other people would have been more militant. Uh, so there are people on, on, on that side of the equation. And, and, and there were people who actually held it against him that he went behind. I mean, that he was such, so much part of the collective, but he made this particular decision around negotiation. And hell, he must have been put through indignity by that bastard P.W. Buerta. I mean, I just heard the other day from someone who told me, someone, an insider who told me that, uh, that P.W. Buerta wouldn't allow him to come in the front door, even when he was secretly coming for talks. He couldn't come in the front door of Grotesque. The, his residence, he had to go in through the back door. One thing that stands out about Madiba, uh, when you compare him to other political leaders, uh, both here and in other countries, is that he actually had the ability to to understand and support criticism and satire. I, I got a phone call from him out of the blue. And the phone call, you know, took me completely by surprise and he played around with me and as he, as he tended to do with, with people, I found out afterwards. And I said to him, you know, the, 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 the thing that m most impresses me, apart from the fact that you just, you know, picked up the phone and called me yourself, which was incredible, but I said, the cartoons since I met you, I had met him in 94, you would have seen them becoming more and more critical of, of the ANC and of government. And he said, oh, but that is your job. And that, to answer your question, is the difference between Madiba and all the rest. Leadership qualities like those may be difficult to find but Mandela himself believes they can be learned. Around the mountain from where Zapiro has his studio is the University of Cape Town. My name is Gift Bule. I'm studying medical honours at University of Cape Town Medical School in Human Genetics. Um, I'm from the Northwest, a small town called Mafikeng, and I am part of the Mandela Roads Foundation. Gift Pule has attracted the attention of an organisation that is taking Mandela's belief in the importance of leadership and education into the future. As a young boy, I always wanted to understand things at the smallest level possible. I'd always get frustrated in class, for instance, when a teacher would go through a certain concept halfway through because I would not get the gist of it. I always wanted to get the whole picture, however, build it up with the smallest blocks possible. And I always thought that genetics allowed, I mean, it, it is basically the blueprint of all life. One thing that Mr. Mandela was very, very clear on when he asked us to set up this foundation 
is he, he said he wanted it to be based on talent only. He said he wanted one of his organizations, because we are only one of them, to celebrate African excellence. And that's a wonderful brief. It makes my job, I can't think of a, of a better job, uh, than having the ability and the resources to go out there, find the best and the brightest, and give them this amazing opportunity, which allows them to move from being very good at what they're doing to being potentially great. The time he spent with Mandela as a journalist gave him insight into the man. That is, um, I was born in the trans sky, uh, and Madiba always made a, a nice joke of that, but here it was very serious as he wanted to spend his last day as president back in the trans sky, and he offered, uh, he asked me if I'd accompany him, so that's on his presidential jet, it was a wonderful moment. As I said to you, as long as it comes over as being a black... Remember, he opened negotiations with the apartheid government from prison without the agreement of his, uh, of his colleagues, and that wasn't necessarily going to be accepted, so he took the risk. That is leadership. That is real leadership. He analyzed the situation in this country, and he decided that either reconciliation was going to be offered to those who were going to give up power, he was going to charm them out of power, um, or we would simply continue where we, where we were, and in the end, inevitably, the majority would win, but they would inherit a smoldering wreck of a country. That's, that's what he decided. That sort of leadership is what the Foundation hopes to encourage and nurture in its African scholars. Was Mandela too conciliatory? So timing is good. Timing is okay, good. You tweet us out. Yeah. Ahmed Kathrada is an old colleague of Mandela's and was jailed alongside him. There was our former enemy. There were the rival organizations. But the main thing was our former oppressors. Okay. So the first period was reconciliation. And that was uh, Madiba's presidency. The five years he spent a lot of his time uh, on reconciliation, forgiveness, reconciliation. Of course, it was accepted by everybody, but he became the public face of, of, of that aspect. I think he had superhuman qualities of being able to suck it up and, and, and figure out what the best way is to, to, to do something knowing that he's going to have to ex absorb some kind of indignity and kind of go against uh, some principled but, but, but continuously militant comrades, all of that. I think he had an incredible ability to understand the big picture. Zapiro's pictures have chronicled all of Mandela's presidency. Those years included some magnificent triumphs not only of the personal kind for Mandela, but also for the nation, including on the sports field. Mandela continued to be fated around the world, and at home continued to pull everyone together behind the ideal of nationhood. But those golden years of the new South Africa were not without pain. The Truth and Reconciliation Committee laid bare some gruesome facts. And as not all the atrocities were laid at the door of the apartheid regime, this made for uncomfortable reading for the ANC. Mandela may have been forgiving of criticism, but others were not. Mandela's romance with Grassa Michelle, following his acrimonious divorce from Winnie, was an easy subject for some light-heartedness. And politics being politics, Mandela's image couldn't always be kept squeaky clean. Central Ichlachla the Righteous. It's nothing serious, just the occasional slipped halo. Now, that was Jake Scherbel, but it could have been anyone. And they're trying to get the, you know, the halo back with the giant crane. And there's an ironic use of the the saint, because he's, do, he's doing something where his saintliness is, is, is showing a few cracks. Inevitably, the five years of his presidency passed by almost too quickly. 
and at the end of his first term, Mandela, just as he had promised, stood down. It was a sad moment for a nation that had fallen in love with a living example of what is possible, if only we dare dream. After Mandela stepped down from the presidency in 1999, he and his unmistakable shirts continued to grace the world stage. Thanks to his moral authority, he was increasingly in demand as an international diplomat and peacemaker who worked hard to advance his continent. His busy schedule centered around a rather special building in Johannesburg. Welcome to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Uh, this has been the post-presidential office of Nelson Mandela since 1999 and uh, we're in the process of converting it into the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory. I'll take you down the passage and show you where his office has been, uh, just down here. The plan is for us ultimately to create a permanent exhibition on his life and times, right down the passage we've just been walking down and ending here with the office as it is, as you see it, uh, as a permanent uh, memorial to him. These are things that he uh, uh, wants to have around him. Uh, an example is that picture over there. Um, he said to me, I must, I must have a picture of Walter, uh, Walter Sisulu. And um, so I talked to Peter Magubane, who donated that framed picture. Uh, the next time that uh, Madiba came into the office, as he walked through, he saw the picture, and uh, his only comment was, ah, Walter's with us today. Uh, but that illustrates, you know, here, here for example, this book, um, it's been his favorite book over the last three or four years. It's a massive one uh, on Muhammad Ali. And he would often just sit at the desk and for 45 minutes or so just be paging through, reading text, looking at, at images. You'll see there's a photograph of uh, Muhammad Ali uh, right behind his desk. So this is where he would sit and um, the pictures that you see around here are ones that are especially meaningful to him. I mean, this one, for example, uh, is the only image of him with uh, President Obama. And uh, it, it was taken in 2005 uh, when Madiba was in Washington. They met very briefly. This was taken by an amateur. Uh, I think it was on someone's cell phone, actually. And this particular print was made and given to Madiba as a gift by President Obama. <music> In 2004, Nelson Mandela officially retired from public duty. But his dream of a proud, successful Africa saw him campaign untiringly for the World Cup, which South Africa successfully hosted in 2010. In spite of health issues, Mandela remained busy, even after the World Cup. The foundation building has been turned into the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, housing treasured Mandela memorabilia. The primary inspiration uh, that Nelson Mandela offers South Africans is the, the long haul, the commitment to a long process. It's not about a quick fix. What won't be forgotten is the man who helped make sure that South Africa's great hill of freedom could be climbed at all. And we love the, um, uh, the man, even in the next 10, 20 years, we'll still be talking about him and our children and our children's children will be talking about him.